with the participants. Okay, there we go. And here comes all of our guests. They'll come in muted. So Rodney, should we, should we be clicking on this meeting as being recorded? Continue? Right, you just continue. Uh, that prompt that you're seeing is the con consent to that they can capture your video feed. Okay. Yeah. Do we hit admit? We don't have to do that, do we? No, we're admitting people as they come in, Tom. I just saw it there and I right. something, something comes up, I always hit it. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of clarification. Uh, today's meeting's a little different uh, because we have a lot of uh, presenters who are designated co-hosts. Co-hosts will see some prompts. You can avoid those. Sue and I will manage them on your behalf. And everyone else will come in when you're connected with, to audio. Your microphone's intentionally muted. We will unmute you at different parts of the program, particularly at the end when we get to Q&A. Just one second, I wanna make sure everybody has full audio and full connection before we, we begin. So thank you for your patience. Can we tap the little dots next to view in the upper right-hand corner? Does that show everybody? Yes, so Chris, uh, you will be able to change your view and to see everyone, you want to put your screen into gallery view. Uh, right now, if you're just seeing me as the big picture, that means it's in speaker view and those icons uh, or those controls are usually at the top portion of your screen. Oh, no, I'm seeing, um, I think 11 people. Right. Based on your screen size, you'll see fewer or, or more people. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, I see about 15. But if I made my window larger, I could see 24 or more. Yeah. And if you don't see everyone, there's usually an arrow if you're on a computer that will take you to the next cluster of people. If you're on a tablet, you can swipe and you'll see another screen with additional names or video feeds. Oh, okay, I'm on gallery view, <clears throat> but it only um, fills a little less than half of my screen. I don't know why. Uh, that's happened with some others. Okay, well, you are fully connected. We can see you, we can hear you. We see many of our friends joining us here today. So I don't wanna delay the program, uh, let me just welcome you all to Zoom Time Knowledge. Uh, many of you have participated before. Uh, we've hosted plenty of these throughout the year since we've been online. Uh, this is our next to last program scheduled uh, for this semester. Uh, so we appreciate everyone joining us. This, of course, is a free public education program hosted by the James Madison University Lifelong Learning Institute. And the way that we're able to make these programs free is because of the volunteer uh, participation of all of our guest presenters. Uh, so here at the front end, I wanna thank everyone who is attending, but also everyone who is contributing their knowledge as part of our learning community and our conversation today. Uh, my name is Rodney Wolfenbarger. If I haven't met you, I serve as director of the Lifelong Learning Institute. And my job, it's my pleasure to introduce two of our co-presenters today. Uh, I call them co-hosts. They're designated as such in the, um, within Zoom uh, because they are going to host the conversation today. They, they're not only going to host it, they coordinated it. Uh, so I wanna provide a special welcome and introduction to Bob Burson and Jack Greer. And I wanna give you a little about their bio, even though they will, um, introduce themselves in maybe a more extended way, and they will be introducing uh, all of our other guests who will be participating and contributing. Uh, Bob Burson is a JMU Emeritus professor who is a longtime teacher, musician, and local activist. Uh, Bob is also author of two art history and appreciation texts. Uh, those include Worlds of Art and Responding to Art. I also want to welcome and provide an introduction to Jack Greer, who served as the founding director of the University of Maryland Environmental Finance Center and as director of communications and public affairs uh, for the UMC Grant College. 
Jack is co-author of Chesapeake Futures, Choices for the 21st Century, and author of the fi fiction collection, Abraham's Bay and Other Stories. After meeting uh, during their doctoral studies in the mid 1970s, Beerson and Greer have reconnected to publish the book that we will be discussing today that's titled Better With Age, Creativity, Discovery and Surprise. And they also play together in two local bands still striving uh, to be better with age. Uh, Bob, Jack, thank you so much for being here, for coordinating this conversation and for taking the lead, navigating us through uh, the five additional presenters who you will introduce and we look forward to hearing from today. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Rodney. That was such a good introduction. I don't think we need to introduce ourselves anymore. <laughs> uh, I will just say that I, I have um, had a, a long connection with LLI from actually 2011 to 2018. It involved eight different courses and four 10-day tours, annual 10-day tours to Italy, focusing on Florence four times and three times and Venice one time. And I see some people in the audience who were probably part of either the tours or the courses. So I'm excited to see the people out there. Um, how did the book come about? Well, as I was entering my 70s, um, I began thinking very seriously about all the challenges, physical, cognitive, spiritual, of going into my, into my later years, into these, these last decades. And um, as I've often done, I've, I've asked friends and family members um, their thoughts, um, gotten their insights. Um, and so I sent out a, a brief email. So this book all starts with an email on May 23rd, 2017. And just briefly, dear family members and friends, I've been thinking of a new book project, a collection of stories by friends and family members in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. I think the writing and reading of these stories could be both affirmative and inspirational. So I'd like to know your reaction and if you'd be interested in participating as a writer of a story or two. You might even have a story ready to go. Well, within a day or two, Tom Arthur responds, he has a story ready to go and he sends it over and that was inspirational. I, you know, here's this enthusiastic response immediately followed in short order by my 90 year old aunt uh, about forming a, kind of a new chapter in her life in terms of uh, a career in, the, in her 70s, and then followed by another cousin of mine. So this kind of enthusiastic response got the ball rolling. And then my longtime friend, Jack Greer, immediately was involved. And um, we had a collaborative project going. And we received many wonderful stories uh, and actually two poems and a song. So we, we had a lot right away, not right away, over this next, this about one year period to start to organize and to edit. And I was kind of a, an editor in a general way. And Jack was a very professional, detailed editor of all the stories and brought the book to a, you know, to a highly professional level. So um, let me read Jack's preface because I think that sums up what the book is about really well. And then I'll turn this over to Jack. So this is, this is my co-editor Jack Greer writing the preface. Age can take many things from us, our muscle mass, our memory, our mobility, but age can also bring unlooked for gifts, a new passion, new friends, new understandings. These gifts come to us in different ways, and often we must seek them out, or at least be open to them. In this collection of essays, we meet a range of men and women in their later years who have found a path to new energy through personal explorations, working for social responsibility, responsibility or discovering a new passion. Some essays reveal lessons learned after a lifetime. For some, growing older has meant new freedom from lifelong responsibilities, from a particular drudgery, or from a certain guilt. 
One writer featured in our prelude is beginning to compose experimental poems in her 80s. The theme running through all these pieces, some long, many short, is that our later years need not focus on decline. To the contrary, there is much to discover when we enter this new phase and many aspects of life, relationships, creative activities, even contributions to society at large can be better with age. And let me turn it over to Jack. I don't know, Jack, if I need to actually say anything more. I think the introduction was so good that Rodney did. I think we're good. Okay, think, let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah, hello everybody and welcome to this. Thanks for, for coming. Um, I have to say working with Bob in this project has been terrific. Um, Bob is basically a more optimistic person than I am, I think. And uh, so during this pretty dark time, uh, it was very uplifting for me to be editing these essays. And they really, uh, they speak to so many things that we deal with as we get older. And frankly, not even as we get older, just as we are living, you know, um, just many inspirational uh, pieces, poems, as Bob said, uh, and mostly essays. And uh, it was a joy to go through them. Um, age, of course, is not always a, uh, a great thing, as uh, many of us know. And I always think of Yeats's uh, famous lines, an aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick, which is not particularly promising, you know. But then he goes on to say, unless soul clap, clap its hands and sing, and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress. Um, I love that image of the soul clapping, but you have to wonder what does that mean, practically speaking? Um, and I think what it often means is, uh, as we've seen in these essays, people taking on things that are new and challenging in, in later life, or going back to pick up something that they've left behind many years ago in some cases and uh, re-engaging themselves with that. And I, all that takes a certain amount of courage. And uh, I think that's what you see in these essays. It's certainly true of Tom Author's uh, essay. Um, it takes a lot of courage to direct uh, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf. <laughs> so uh, Tom is going to read, and let me just uh, read from his bio, uh, though I'm sure for many of you, he, he needs no introduction. Tom Arthur was born in 1937 in Chicago, Illinois. He's a retired theater professor, director, and current blog writer. Early on, he was in advertising during the day and acting at night. And before he uh, enrolled at Indiana University for graduate work. He taught at Illinois State University to students who later formed the Steppenwolf Theater. He came to James Madison in 1973 to help develop a theater uh, department from what had been an extracurricular activity. He led the unit for 25 years before becoming an acting teacher specialist. He has directed over 100 plays on campus, in the community, and at summer festivals, and was a JMU Dinner Theater founder. He and his fellow academic slash art historian wife Kay have lived in Harrisonburg's Old Town for 42 years and are active on the Arts Council and with the Lifelong Learning Institute. They have four children and eight grandchildren. So without further ado, um, we'll hear from Arthur, Tom Arthur reading from his essay, I'm Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Tom? Thank you, Jack. <clears throat> it's nice. Uh, I've just signed on to direct Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf for the local theater in the fall. I'd retired from directing last year, but when asked to do something one last time, thought of the play because of playwright Edward Albee's recent death. Only then did I reread Wolf and was appalled. It's a wonderful script, but long, three hours and three acts filled with language frowned upon by the Mennonite community in this area. It's also demanding for actors and the director. I was right to retire last year. 
I watched Tyrone Guthrie directing actors in a 1969 touring production of Barry Stavis' Lamp at Midnight starring Morris Karnofsky. Guthrie at 69 couldn't hear and kept shouting for already bellowing actors to speak up. Karnofsky at 72 couldn't remember his lines and was being carried, which is theater for cued, coached and rescued by a younger cast member friend of mine. I'll never do that. I said to myself, when my time comes, I'll retire gracefully. And when I wrote this, I was just 80. On the other hand, I do know something about Edward Albee. In October of 1979, I was a host for Albee's appearance at James Madison University. I'd read many of his plays, seen the 1962 Broadway debut production of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, and directed a pretty well-received production of his A Delicate Balance at the university. I was charged with showing Albee around the campus, making sure he was fed before speaking. My wife and children joined me in taking him to a local restaurant. Albee couldn't have been a better guest. He was knowledgeable about art and music in addition to theater and was kindness itself to our children, treating them with grave respect. During the meal, meal while our youngest on Albee's left was talking about his school day, the playwright stopped said he had a hearing difficulty on that side and insisted they exchange places, which they did. Albee had a great mustache that seemed to belong on his face, not always true of hearsight, hear uh, whatever, decoration. Casual and subdued Ivy League clothes, he watched with eyes both steely and kind. He gave me the impression of being present, but at the same time watching, watching, watching. He seemed to know who he was, genuine, despite being on display so much of the time. I felt I could have called him decades later and he would have remembered who I was. That's not true, of course, but that's a feeling I got. On the last of our three days together, I couldn't resist telling Albie about my own directing a delicate balance. And he responded, that's wonderful. You have the show exactly right. I wish I'd seen your production. It took me days to realize that he said that to everyone outside of New York who did his plays. So. Now I'll be directing Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf for the local little theater, and it frightens me to death. Still, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf is a wonderful play. I liked and respected Albie when I met him. He was nice to my children. And when our version is done, I know what the playwright would say about it. That's wonderful. You have the show exactly right. Wish I'd seen your production. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Tom. Sure. That's terrific. Um, if anyone has questions for Tom, we'll save them till the end when we'll have a question and answer period. Um, so just make some notes for yourself and we'll come back and revisit. But uh, as I said, it does take a lot of courage to, uh, to direct Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf at any age, I think. Our next speaker I'm very pleased to introduce to you is Chris Bolgiano. Uh, as Several of us were saying as we were getting started, uh, we've seen Chris recently doing a Zoom presentation on uh, sediment loads in the watershed of the Shenandoah Valley. And that was really very enlightening. Chris was born in 1948 in Munich, Germany. Uh, she calls herself a mildly amusing nature writer. And uh, she used that form, uh, that androgynous form of her name for early articles about wildlife and hunting and continues because she enjoys the confusion uh, when male readers or editors contact her, expecting, I guess, a guy named Chris. <clears throat> uh, she lives on 112 wooded acres in Western Virginia and focuses on, focuses on environmental history, forest ecology, and most difficult of all, looking for jokes in our environmental crisis. She's written or edited six books, as well as travel and nature articles for the Washington Post and the New York Times, Sierra, Audubon, Wildness, I'm sorry, Wilderness, and other magazines, and syndicated op-eds for the Bay Journal News Service. Several of her books and articles have won literary prizes. So it's with great pleasure, Chris, that I turn this over to you. Thank you, Jack. Um, and thank you also for this great subtitle that you, you put in. Grateful Deadheading, A Gardener's Revelation. Pinch, snip, snap, 
severed spent flowers drop into the compost bucket like guillotined heads into a basket. I pretend they're my bad habits, bad temper, bad hair. If only it was so easy. In the dusk of my life, I go out on my deck of a summer's twilight to groom my kitchen herb garden. Parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme, basil, tarragon, and oregano, plus a scattering of spring onions, live in four large planters on coasters and in one stationary, soil-filled, horse-watering trough. Mixed through all the pots are flowers. First come the early season self-seeding volunteer annuals like violas and the little native poppies. Later come the verbenas, petunias, calendulas, marigolds, and other hummingbird and insect attracting annuals available every spring from the local greenhouse. Sure, we have the big vegetable garden with four long beds that supply most of our meals, either fresh from the root cellar, in the jars I can or the bags I freeze. Growing your own food was basic to the back to the land movement, and we were your basic back to the landers. By the first, first Earth Day in 1970, the husband and I were looking for land on which to become post-industrial pioneers. We were convinced that our generation could change the world by eating low on the food chain. Low is in on your knees, bent over the garden, growing vegetables. Everywhere we looked in our early 20s, we saw a war-centered world. A life lived close to nature seemed the surest way to inner peace. So we told our parents that the lifestyle they had worked all their lives to achieve was meaningless to us and moved from safe and conventional suburbia to the backwoods of rural America. We took flower power seriously and sought out old traditions of making herbal medicines, storing food and aging venison. I'm using the royal we on that last one. 45 years later though, the phrase going back to the land has taken on a darker meaning a more personal recycling kind of meaning. The flower power that once seemed so gentle has revealed itself as the relentless force pushing up daisies in nature's perennial garden. For years, I've called myself an aging hippie, but what looks back at me in the Zoom is an aged hippie. It's the hippie part that matters, I tell myself. Peace, love, and folk rock and roll, the music that sang our youthful idealism. It's while I'm deadheading on the deck in our tiny clearing in the midst of forest that I muse over those old ideals and measure how far I still have to go. It's while deadheading that I admit to myself, I haven't gone the distance yet. Growing old happens to everyone who lives long enough, though I did think it'd take a lot longer than it actually has. No one ever seems quite ready for it, despite its universality. Deadheading has become a ritual of mindful mindlessness, the opposite of going to confession for a Catholic, which I was at an age too young to protest, but recovered from early on. No white bearded white guy behind a cloud is going to tell me what to do. Not even the goddess who has far more clout has driven me to worship anything less solid than the mountain I live on. The closest I've come to religion since childhood is being a bad Buddhist with a mind too peripatetic ever to be empty and compassion that needs a good yoga stretch. The endless cycles of life, death, and weeding the garden are divine enough for me. Sometimes as I'm deadheading, it's hard to tell a flower that's finished from a young bud and I end up plucking off promises for the future. Sometimes when I go away, the flowers go to seed and even removing every dead head doesn't bring back a bloom. No matter. I pour time like water onto the plants, moving my fingers tenderly through them, giving and taking nurture. Deadheading is my meditation on the now. Every decision I've made, every path I've chosen has led me here to this deck, these plants, this forest, on this dwindling summer's day. Light slowly fades as cool air flows down the mountain over my arms. Everything around me is beautiful, perfect. Even the dead leaves and withered flowers I pluck off because they form part of the endless sacred cycle. I vow once again to be worthy of this deck, these plants, this forest, that together 
give me this time of grace. Here is where I contemplate, not just what a long, strange trip it's been, but how grateful I am to have arrived, even with a bad hip. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. But now much better hip, right? Yes, much better. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say, I think one of the biggest, uh, bravest things anyone can do is to keep their sense of humor right on through all of this, you know, so thank you for that. <laughs> um, I'm uh, really delighted to introduce now someone who's going to read one of the two poems that appears in our collection, uh, our other Chris, uh, Chris Edwards, Christine B. Edwards. Um, I will write for, I will read from uh, what she wrote for her biography for the collection. Uh, Chris Edwards was born in 1945 in Alexandria, Virginia. Born a month after World War II ended, I identified as a baby boomer until recently discovering I'm a few months too old for that designation. My father, an engineer, my mother, homemaker, and my sister, then 14, were transplants from New York. Growing up in Fairfax County, I enjoyed reading, but not school. I graduated from Mount Vernon High in 1963, and in 1967, Holland's University, which was then Holland's College, where I was exposed to great books and live authors and discovered I loved to write. My first husband and I raised three children in Orange, Virginia. Albert, gone from us sadly since 2001, Eddie and stepson Steve. After various dead-end jobs, I landed in midlife at The Observer, a now defunct alternative weekly in Charlottesville. That was from 1988 to 1993, then until 2000 at the Harrisonburg Daily News Record and later freelancing. I met and married the delightful Robin McNally here in the Berg. We've enjoyed grandkids, cats, books, travel, and activism. So I'm very happy to introduce Chris Edwards reading her poem. Thank you. Okay, uh, this is titled The Crack in Everything and um, I wrote it in 2017. So I was younger than like <laughs> many of us were. There is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in, wrote Leonard Cohen. And the creak in the tea and the crack in the teacup opens a lane to the land of the dead. W. H. Auden. We are not the same as we were. We will not be the same as we are. Pavers blast the old sidewalk, cracking the initials a small boy wrote with a backwards J 80 years ago before the first concrete dried. Jeremiah, Jack, whoever, wherever he is, he is not the same. Clouds, rainbows, sand dunes, even hills do not stay the same. The cats are not the same, growing older, climbing the high beams less often. often. Once I had other cats, I was not the same. How we were once, we are not, and how we are now, we won't be. A small boy, Ben, who no longer writes his name with the B backwards, may someday rock the world, but does not seem likely to keep the same bond he has now with Spider-Man or the book about monsters he made me read tonight for the 893rd time, falling asleep on my shoulder. And at the old school's reunion, none of the girls will be the same. Do the undergraduates, those strangers gone for summer, ever notice if the stairs in West Norm circa 1842 still have those smooth hollows at their centers, scuffed out a molecule at a time by our footsteps and even by our forebears high button boots? 
on front quad above the white columns and willows beneath our mountain. Do our own young shouts and even gladsome calls of the high buttoned girls still like notes from a singing bowl vibrate far below ears range? Once my mother told me no sound completely dies. That's lovely, Chris, but thank you. And Bob, I, I, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Chris. Um, I'm going to introduce Dave Pruitt, who is going to read about his um, Appalachian Trail experience. But first, these, this background on Dave, who many of you know well from a lot of involvement with LLI. Dave Pruitt, born 1948, Durham, North Carolina. Dave Pruitt is a West Virginia bred computational scientist and mathematics professor, now retired. During his career, which includes stints at NASA Langley Research Center and concluded at James Madison University, he garnered awards both for pioneering computational work and for innovative teaching. Perhaps his proudest accomplishment is the publication of Reason and Wonder, Prager 2012 publication, a 12 year labor of love. Inspired by an honors course at JMU, the book attempts to bridge the divide between science and spirituality while remaining faithful to the essence of each. Dave's wife, Suzanne Federlein, travels the globe as associate director of JMU's Center for International Stabilization and Recovery. The couple resides in Harrisonburg, Virginia, and they have one child, Elena, a millennial who never ceases to amaze and to challenge their perspectives. So before I bring Dave on, I just wanna mention that I've done a fair amount of hiking and camping and backpacking with Dave, and which includes um, three days and nights on the Appalachian Trail. So I'm gonna pull from some of those adventures to give you a sense of how lively these experiences can be. One is on a mountaintop where Dave and I are camped out. This is Shenandoah National Park. And we get three major thunderstorms with lightning strikes coming through the entire night. And we're, we're both flooded and fearing for our lives. And, you know, hoping whether it's God or the universe is going to protect us. So this is not untypical. And Dave often brings rain along on his, his major hikes. So he's, he can be called a rainmaker. Uh, then we have um, another hike where through the night we're having yowling packs of either wild dogs or coyotes running all around and we're in our tents. So these are, you know, kind of typical. And then of course, there's, you know, from lots of rain, you have slippery rocks and all kinds of other um, challenges. So what Dave has gone through shows great courage, persistence, um, just, you know, and it's been a terrific accomplishment. His hiking of the entire Appalachian Trail in Virginia, which is the largest part of the, of the full trail. So Dave, take it away. Thanks, Bob, I think, for that. <laughs> um, my essay is, uh, has the dubious distinction of being the longest one in the book. And I, I love the book, but if I'd known how it was going to turn out, I would have uh, submitted a much shorter one. And uh, this has been edited down uh, to 15 minutes, and my apologies for that. But. The title is Never Too Late for a Trail Name. Ye who love the haunts of nature, love the sunshine of the meadow, love the shadow of the forest, love the wind among the branches, listen to these wild traditions, to this song of Hiawatha. That's by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Since my early teens, I've loved the out of doors and spent many a good moment there, sometimes in the company of others like Bob, often in blissful solitude. At the age of 40, beset by an unexpected urge to solo trek, 
I strapped on a Jansport backpack large enough for a bathtub, filled it with 54 pounds of gear and sustenance, and hiked north on the Appalachian Trail, affectionately the AT. Out of Damascus, Virginia, bound for the high country of Mount Rogers and Grayson Highlands. After a schlep of nine miles, mostly uphill, I collapsed and camped right beside the trail, too exhausted to search for a better spot. Each day thereafter, I grew stronger. By day four, lugging a pack for 15 miles seemed the most natural thing in the world, and taking it off at the end of the day occasioned the euphoria of feeling weightless. Dad, who had just retired, picked me up in the afternoon of the fifth day, and we spent a sweet night with Grandma at the family cabin my halfway house back to civilization. I'd knocked off 55 miles in all and had a glorious adventure. Career and family intervened and few such opportunities presented themselves until I semi-retired at 64. Hiking the full AT and pedaling across country remained on my bucket list, but was I over the hill? Most likely. Certainly my Jansport days were over. The external frame beast in its archaic gear gave way to an internal frame north face, a lightweight down sleeping bag, and the three pound MSR tent. Much as I loved that faithful brass Vea white gas stove, it went to pasture, replaced by a 1.7 ounce titanium contraption atop a five ounce propane canister. In September 2013, my second summer into retirement, my wife dropped me late one morning in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, the rough midpoint of the AT, and I naively headed south and uphill from the Shenandoah River with 40 pounds of gear, including seven days of food. I'd hoped to make 100 miles in a week, and in the process convinced myself that the 25 intervening years since my last solo trek had not robbed me of much stamina. Oh, was I wrong. The route snaked over the infamous boulder-strewn roller coaster that fatigues even veteran Appalachian trailers, past the delicious Bear's Den Youth Hostel, where 30 bucks get you a bed, a shower, a washer, a pizza, and a pint of Ben and Jerry's and to the threshold of Graceful Sky Meadows State Park. I showered at Bear's Den, but left immediately, cognizant that should I remain longer, I'd succumb to the sirens of comfort. On the morning of day five, with 34 miles under my belt and a painful blister at the end of a toe, I awakened to terrifying numbness along my right arm. Fearing heart attack, I popped a baby aspirin, always a companion and called my wife to rescue me at route, foot, uh, at route 50. It wasn't a heart attack, but it was time to throw in the towel. The constant pressure along my right arm, the one in which I held the hiking pole while navigating the roller coaster, had revived an old, old elbow injury and pinched a nerve. Three weeks elapsed before full feeling returned. The next summer, expectations trimmed, I tried again, anticipating a three-day inaugural trek. Two buddies, one of them being Bob, dropped me near Front Royal, Virginia, and joined me for a few miles as I hiked into Shenandoah National Park, headed south. Eight miles and 2,000 feet in elevation later, now alone, I set up the tent on a rocky trail moments ahead of a thunderstorm. On day two, I planned another eight to 10 miles, but unwisely extended to 12, lured by visions of a shower at Matthew's Arm campground. Exhausted and eager to call it a day, I raced downhill to the campground, a descent of 700 feet in elevation, pounding all the way. Alas, there was no shower only a comfort station. Dejected, I rested at a picnic table, 
10 minutes later, I could barely walk, my left knee stiff and agonizingly painful. The following morning, after a nearly sleepless night of continual pain, I hobbled to the Skyline Drive to meet my long-suffering wife, Rescue 2. This time, the injury was severe. I'd mangled the meniscus. For two months, I limped in pain, then spent another two recovering from arthroscopic surgery. It seemed my back packing days were at an end. An orthopedist said, no more, take to biking instead. Now that was no doubt good advice from a physical point of view, but deadly from a psychological one. Fortunately, my general practitioner recognized the dilemma and gave tentative blessings to continued hiking with provisos. During the spring of recovery following surgery, pondering options, I sought a compromise with myself. Were I to limit the number of days per trek to three, the maximum pack weight to 30 pounds, and the maximum distance to eight miles per day, could I just possibly keep trekking long enough to complete the Virginia AT, a full quarter of the 2200 mile footpath? And more to the bargain, with distance expectations diminished, might there be more occasions to stop and smell the wildflowers along the way? I gave it a shot. The third summer, I completed five short section hikes, about 20 miles each, finishing the AT through Shenandoah National Park. By the end of a section, the troublesome knee was sore and stiff, but recovered after a few days of rest and acupuncturist recommended exercises to open the joint. Some prophylactic ibuprofen before hiking also helped tamp down swelling. And sure enough, a turtle's pace had advantages. The experience became richer. By the end of the fourth summer, having turned 68, I'd completed all sections of the AT between the Shenandoah and James Rivers. Rhododendron tunnels, ever-changing rock formations, unencumbered vistas, rippling brooks, nighttime chirps, musty smells, and immense silence. These beckon my soul when reason and comfort say no. Still, for safety's sake, it's a relief to encounter other hikers. On the AT, there are day hikers, section hikers, and through hikers. Through hikers complete the entire AT in one long walk of four to six months. Two thirds of those who set out never finish. If you've never attempted a multiple day trail hike with a load, you cannot imagine how arduous the task. The demographic distribution of through hikers is distinctly bimodal. There are the young Turks in their 20s who haven't started careers, and there are those of us retirees in our 50s and 60s with time on our hands. There are precious few in between. Over the past five hiking seasons, I've developed some impressions of through hikers. They come in waves. The young, fit, and, gre and gregarious head north from Springer Mountain, Georgia in late February or early March. They boogie often knocking off 20 to 24 miles a day. Their wave crests near Roanoke, Virginia in May. The older through hikers and the more introverted ones, young or old, come in the second wave. They tend to start later, say in April, to avoid the mobs in the first wave. And they pass through central Virginia late in the month of June. They're not as likely to be burning up the trail They'll stop, make small talk, give you tips, and most of all, warm you with a smile. On the last day of my most recent section hike, I encountered Rusty, resting on a rock doing a water break. He looked to be about 50, a build, a bandana, and longish gray hair. We were headed in opposite directions, 
So I asked him if the trail to the south crossed the Blue Ridge Parkway. I was due to meet my wife at milepost 74.9 around 3 p.m. My trail map was inconclusive about whether the parkway and footpath physically crossed or were only proximate. Rusty happily opened the Appalachian Trail app on his iPhone to address my concerns. It revealed that although the road and the trail did not quite cross, they were just yards, not miles apart at the rendezvous point. As Rusty navigated the iPhone with dexterity, I noticed his malformed hands and that he sometimes used a knuckle to tap the screen. I couldn't help but wonder if his feet were similarly afflicted and how that might affect long distance travels by foot. I didn't ask, of course. Still, something exchanged in both the silences and the words between us, and I felt a kinship. On that day, I met several like Rusty, each a kind soul, a lover of the haunts of nature. I felt more than ever that given a chance, nature can redeem the hearts of men and women. Through hikers assume trail names, losing their given names and non-trail identities. A trail name I suppose offers some useful blend of familiarity and anonymity. No one signs the logbook at a trail shelter with their given name. And when you meet another hiker, you ask only for a trail name. Some trail names, say Montana, associate the hiker with where they're from. Others get identified with an item of clothing or gear, say bandana. Most earn their trail name in Native American fashion from some random trail event that seems a defining experience. The Appalachian Trail Through Hikers Register of 2015 features Wistful, Junebug, Bonbon, and Dreamcatcher, among hundreds of others. The Memorial Appalachian Trail footbridge over the James River is so named tongue in cheek for William Foote, a dedicated Appalachian Trail main maintainer and promoter. He and his wife, both through hikers, were collectively the happy feet. Now, not being a through hiker, I don't have a trail name. I've toyed with a few, but until recently, none seemed to fit. When I was a child, younger than the age of three, when memory sets in, mom read to me, from Longfellow's Song of Hiawatha. Although I have no conscious recollection of those moments, what the epic poem now evokes in me is primal. I have absolutely no doubt that Longfellow's words are connected in some mysterious way to both my affinity for all things Native American and my love of nature. As I was parting from Rusty, having just learned his trail name, he inquired about mine. Well, I don't really have one, I confessed, then added almost in the same breath, but I'm thinking of Hiawatha. Hiawatha, I like that. All right, thank you, Dave. Thank you, Bob. Bravo, bravo. All right, I'd like to introduce Robin McNally now. Um, he will be our final reader and then we'll open it up for comments, um, questions and responses from our uh, readers and, um, and hearing, hearing from all of you. So this is Robin McNally, born 1937 in Buffalo, New York. Robin writes, I was the son of a father who was a reference librarian and a mother who was a reader of Dickens and an avid theater goer 
and reader. After graduation from Bennett High, academically the best school in Buffalo in the 1950s, I enrolled at St. Lawrence University, a small liberal arts institution north of the Adirondacks, where I graduated in 1960, magna cum laude, with an English major and a philosophy minor. I did my graduate studies at Princeton University in the early 60s. My focus while there was on American literature, specific the writers of the Romantic period. In 1965, I joined the English faculty at James Madison University, at the time, quote unquote, Madison College. Before retirement in 1998, I taught a wide array of courses in writing, literature, and film. On June 19, 1999, I married my best companion, Christine Edwards. And I would say, I would also like to add that um, I've been in breakfast groups with Robin and he's, as Chris says, a delightful companion always, and a great punster, a man of many, many puns and very creative punster. Uh, in addition, he and Chris are very active social activists. And I, I was so impressed with Robin's kind of activism during the change campaign in Harrisonburg in 2000, going door to door and knocking virtually on every door in Harrisonburg, I kind of nicknamed him the commander. So Commander McNally, take over. <laughs> Thank you, Bob, for that nice introduction. Uh, I remember the change campaign itself and uh, remember that was for the golf course. We were fighting the golf course. And I thought my performance was about par as I knocked on doors. So that's my pun. Here's, here's my uh, essay. Uh, this was, uh, of course, written in 2017. I mentioned the solar eclipse here. Uh, it's uh, entitled Reflections on Aging. Recently, and far too quickly, I turned 80. And in a gala celebration, my twin brother Bruce and I shared some early memories. That experience stimulated me to assess the overall condition of my life over the last two decades or so. Those years roughly covering my retirement from James Madison University's English department in 1998 to the present. Strangely, this time frame represents to me the phenomenon of living life backwards. For after retirement, I immediately, and for the first time ever, bought a house, signing the mortgage on my 61st birthday. The next year, I married the love of my life, Chris Edwards. Nearly 30 years after my first catastrophic marriage. During the last two decades, I've also plunged into a new teaching career in JMU's Lifelong Learning Institute. This tenure has been a richer one than my first stint in the classroom. Not only have I been able to create and teach a broader range of literature-centered courses, but to do so before and among students who are truly my peers, not just in approximate years lived, but in the depth of perception and perspective those years have provided. And I haven't even mentioned all those travels Chris and I have undertaken two across the USA auto excursions and one by train across Canada with a couple of pre-Mary II crossings to England flown in, an Avalon River cruise to the south of France. And in August of this year, a road trip to Kentucky to see the total solar eclipse. I dare not even get started talking about the other itinerary I've been able quite literally to book involving those previously accumulated and unread great works. 
I'll avoid listing them all, but the usual suspects are there. Cruz Swan's Ray, for instance, and James is the ambassadors, and Maddox Ford's the good soldier. Of course, I can't deny these later years have brought the usual diminishments, herring loss, stiffness, more stretching before and after walks, spotty memory. Why can I remember Judy Canova's name and forget Merle Erber Oberon's? At 80, however, one rivets one's attention most acutely on the distinct prospect of not being alive to celebrate the 90th year. There's a refrain in one of Longfellow's poems that proclaims, quote, the thoughts of youth are long, long thoughts, end quote. The thoughts of the elderly may also be long, but they linger more and more on the brevity of the time remaining. I don't think I fear death itself, but I do worry about encroaching debility and dementia intervening before that end point. Death seems more strange to me than frightening, albeit somewhat sad, like being taken away from a story you really invested yourself in. Alas, it goes without saying that you've already mentally lost your way. A final reckoning we all have to make in these later years, of course, is a moral one in answer to the question, have I in general been a good person. A long time ago, I read an essay in which the now forgotten author mentioned the dying words of a prominent French woman, a courtesan, I believe she was, whose memorable last words were, je me regret, literally translated, I regret me. I've never forgotten that. What a terrible epitaph the woman's statement implies. She was not saying merely that some of her actions were regrettable, but that she was, at her very core, unredeemable. I don't know what epitaph I might deserve, but I do hope and believe I've lived a life that has earned me the scrupulously circumspect comment by someone, quote, for all his awful puns, he was a good enough fellow. And <laughs> bravo, Robin, bravo. Punster extraordinaire. <laughs> okay, we're going to open this up for comments uh, and or questions from the audience. And we'd love to hear from you. So please, please speak up. Join us in the conversation. Thanks, Bob, and I want to thank everyone for your contributions uh, and being part of this conversation. I, I've loved hearing your narratives and your recollections uh, about the advantages of aging. As, as Bob mentioned at the beginning, at Bob and Jack both, we often hear the opposite. Uh, so I'm going to get everyone unmuted here. We've restored microphone access. Uh, if you are looking at your screen and you're, you're seeing uh, videos of all of the presenters. I've spotlighted those. If you're running a new version of Zoom, of Zoom. if not, you'll be seeing everyone. Uh, but as you speak, hopefully we will see your video pop up. So if you have a question or comment or feedback uh, for any of the hosts or presenters, uh, feel free to chime in. Rodney? Uh or, or I have a question for Robin. Robin, you said you went to Sarah Lawrence College. St. Lawrence. Oh, St. Lawrence. Lawrence. St. Oh. Lawrence is probably, uh, our probably most famous alumnus was Kirk Douglas. Oh. <laughs> he was class of 1939, so he was a few years ahead of me. I was thinking so, Sarah Lawrence. There's a building name for him because he donated a million dollars to have it and other things done. Mm -hmm. uh, I was. I thought you said Sarah Lawrence and uh, Joseph Campbell was there, and I was just wondering yeah. if you'd ever encountered him, but I guess not. So, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think Rodney, while we're waiting for the audience to get revved up and, and involved here, this is the book, um, Better With Age, and it's available in one single place in Harrisonburg, uh, Oasis Arts Center, but easily available online through Amazon for $9.99. So if you're interested, you can, there are terrific stories throughout, um, and we hope you'll get yourself a copy. So please audience, join us. Break down that wall of silence. <laughs> Thank you all very much. This was fascinating. I enjoyed it immensely. And I wanted to ask David Pruitt, did you ever finish the Appalachian Trail or is that still a work in progress? Uh, well, after my knee problems, I, uh, my goal was not to finish the AT, it was to finish all of Virginia, which is one quarter of the entire Appalachian Trail. And I did, I did that in um, August of 2019. The last section was um, uh, called Garden Mountain around Burke's Garden in Tassel County. And then I did, uh, recently did um, all of Maryland, but Maryland's only 40 miles. <laughs> and I've decided to, uh, it's time to hang up the backpack because it's too hard on my knees. And I'm um, now exploring rails to trails biking. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, sounds like a plan. Yeah, yeah, I, will, I will say that adaptation seems to be a uh, major theme uh, in this book and with our authors. And I'm sure with everyone, you know, it's uh, uh, what's the next thing, you know, down the, down the road. And uh, keeping mm -hmm. it as the Buddhist would say. Barbara, do you have a question or comment? I see that you unmuted your microphone. Yes, uh, this was. This has to be one of my most favorite noontime zooms. Oh, great! I loved it. I loved every bit of it, mm. and I'm going to buy the book. <laughs> 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 I'd like to read all of your essays, your poems, whatever, again. I really would. Lovely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, something Jack and I were talking about, if, if people don't have specific comments or questions, which we certainly invite, um, we, we wanted to ask the audience what experiences or activities you find meaningful or that give you a full sense of life. Um, and um, we'd be fascinated, really very interested to hear what, what, what those might be. So if anyone's willing to share on that as well, we'd like to make that part of the discussion. I'm a little ahead of where you are right now and or back behind maybe. I was thinking about hiking, uh, I often thought how nice it would be if I could do the Appalachian Trail from end to end or even in Virginia, but I'm not a real backpacker camper. So I find that I don't even want to have to keep up with other hikers. I want to be able to sit by the road or the trail and, and closely examine the, the uh, flowers or see what bird that is that's singing if possible. It takes time, and so you kind of give me permission to enjoy that, which uh, maybe is what I can get out of the trail. Right, right, for sure. Absolutely. I think of Milton's line, you know, uh, they also serve who stand and wait. So uh, <laughs> I think just being on the trail, uh, sometimes just not going anywhere is, is really worth it. Yeah. Yes, yeah, something uh, Jack just mentioned, the, the, the word being, and I think that notion a, a lot of us have is always of becoming, doing, and being, that state of being is so central, I think, uh, you know, for, for a good life. And that's, 
Bob, I, I think I've mentioned this to Dave. Dave and I have a, had other conversations through before and after classes that he's led. I know I've mentioned it to Sue. My concept of aging has certainly changed being part of the lifelong learning community. Um, I remember one of my, my um, most present memories growing up as a kid is sitting with my great grandmother who never left the house. She never had a driver's license and, and I, I just couldn't understand that, depended upon other people for transportation, lived in a rural community uh, where even in childhood, the norm was I'll go into town Maybe once a month we'll get what we need, but everything else we make, including their clothing. And I learned that through my mom's experience, just talking about the generational differences. Uh, but when she got older, she rarely left the house. And I would sit with her as a kid while everyone else was out in the yard. Uh, the men were working on cars. Uh, the women were doing something else. Uh, the children were out and about. Um, just chasing fireflies or whatever the case may be. And I was sitting in there with my great grandmother because I could recognize uh, that, that she was lonely, that everyone else, she just seemed invisible uh, to others. And, you know, in this rural community, there weren't street lights. Um, it was just like if, if people were working on a car, they hung up a lamp. You know, and often that was the kid's job, hold this light so I can see to finish whatever I'm doing with this engine. But I would go in there and sit with my great grandmother and she would tell me about, you know, what she had experienced, um, not always forthcoming with details, but one thing she told me about aging, and it made me fearful of aging. Um, she said, people forget about us. I remember what's what's on the TV. That that moment is so clear to me. She's watching like the 700 Club. <laughs> She's sitting on uh, this sofa. <laughs> the door is open, and she can see like red buds and things like uh, blooming uh, just over the hillside. And then there's a creek that's that's just blocked out by trees. And she's sitting there on the sofa in her house dress, her slippers has a Bible beside her, some blackened bananas. Uh, and, sh and she says, you don't wanna get old. Mm -hmm. And for the longest time, I thought aging was something to avoid, you know, because I'd seen just, just how disconnected she was from her family and, and maybe feeling what, this is my interpretation, I shouldn't speak for, but I felt maybe out of sync with history and time. Um, and she lived to be 92 years old. And um, those conversations, just so important to me when I look back, um, very formative that I, they had 13 years of life with her. And I, there's still this sadness uh, that maybe she didn't get as much enjoyment and, and pleasure out of her later years um, as maybe she could have. Uh, but a lot of that, I, I, I've also become more mature and I look back and I say, you know, she's part of a different generation. And with that generation came different expectations uh, and certainly limitations in her later years. But yeah, th that's a recollection that some of your stories have triggered for me. And, and so again, thank you. That's how I'm relating to what you shared. And I just felt like contributing to that. So thanks for making space for that recollection. Well, that was, thank you so much for that heartfelt reflection. And um, <laughs> the work that you're doing is such a great benefit to all people, you know, in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. So you're carrying on at this, I guess maybe the, the, that remembrance or whatever that motivated you, you're, you're in the field to, bring us to life, expand our, you know, knowledge, our boundaries, give stimulation. So thank you, thank you. Anyone else from either our readers or the audience who'd like to say, say anything? Uh -huh. Go ahead. I think, uh, I think. John Asa Hersler speaking. Um, I was just thinking of Robin McNeil speaking about um, uh, aging and uh, pr approaching death and so on. 
and whether we've accomplished much. Uh, I remember quite a couple of years ago there was a, there was a picture in the uh, daily paper that pictured an Old Testament prophet with a straggly beard protesting the death penalty, all by himself protesting the death penalty. And now I'm aware that our government of Virginia has quit killing people uh, uh, as a punishment. So thank you, Robin McNeil. McNally. Mm. Excuse me. You've done well. Thank you. Thank you for that. Dave, did you want to say something? Yeah, I think it was Bill who raised the issue of being versus doing. Um, and I, I ran across a quotation by um, Thomas Merton that I'm going to butcher because I don't have it in front of me. So I'll just paraphrase it. But he said there's a contemporary, a, a sort of strange contemporary sort of violence in our lives that is over um, over stimulus, over scheduling, overdoing, and um, so many of us are so invested in career, um, and career is all of, largely all about doing, 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 and so one of the advantages of a of aging is to if one can do it gracefully is to sort of shed the constant focus on doing and try to settle into to being. And uh, my personal philosophy on this is that there's nothing wrong with doing, but our doing would be more effective if we uh, were better beings. And if, um, uh, if we knew who we were, if, um, know thyself being the, the, the original wisdom. If we knew ourselves better, then our doing would be um, more uh, effective because we would be coming at it from a deeper sense of being. Yeah, thanks, Dave, for that. Uh, I might just mention, you know, there are, of course, other essays in the book. Uh, some of them that focus on doing and some of them more on being. Um, one of them, um, a woman in her retirement is working on memorializing the lynchings that occurred in her part of Florida um, in the past. And uh, this is, of course, after she's retired and she's taken this on as a kind of a mission and really made a huge contribution. And then in terms of being, uh, I think of Martha Woodruff's essay called Dancing with Cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, she talks about dancing, that she's always danced. And um, as you may know, Martha's really dealing with cancer now. And yet uh, she's found a way to be and to express herself. And it's a very lively essay and uh, with great esprit. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, she's still dancing and she plans to dancing as long as she can right right yeah and, I, and harvey yoder writes kind of a final um piece for the book and it's it's i guess you'd say it's a poem uh, or an essay i'm not sure exactly how to categorize it but his image is one that touched me very deeply and um i think jack and i would agree the all of the stories have really touched us it's really they've moved us they've inspired us and Harvey's image of a life well lived is you use yourself fully up so that mm -hmm. at the very end you're ready to go because you've you you're spent you know you've done everything you can mm -hmm. and uh, I, I really love that image I think it's a it's a very powerful one for me yeah. so any other comments questions Okay, if not, I think we'll, we'll, we'll call this to, um, to an end. And it's been a great pleasure to, to share uh, the readings with you and um, introduce the book to you and wish you all the best. Thank you, friends, for joining us. Hope everyone has a great day. Thank you, Rodney. Bye. Thanks all. Thank you.
Thank you.